Biggs. <laughs> Los Angeles flying apart. In the streets. In the suburbs. In the wind. In the barely kept Hollywood bathroom, wheezing, vomiting, coughing up blood. These past few days, these past few years, I've spread myself across this sprawl. And now fear this drive. They kill me. Kill us all. And I wander. Over the general hospital between whose walls desperation wears in high concentration. Upon the faces of the shop and prematurely ill alike. As they wait upon the news of illness they cannot afford to have. Survival without insurance. This may take a while. Los Angeles is full of untold misery. A homeless man sleeps next to me, and I can smell the years of hard distance between who he is now and who he may have been. And all that stands from him in the bitter wind is chance. It's the kindness of a night nurse who let him sleep in peace. Los Angeles is full of good people who from time to time will turn a blind eye to killer policy. And I wonder, I'm going to bounce checks, free clinics, carry cash, and leave the count the negative stand to me and him. Me and the bitter wind, and if so, where would I go? From Venice to San Francisco, there's not a war on the homeless, a war on the dispossessed. There are fewer and fewer options. They've got shelters for women and children, all in that me. Just man up, old boy, to that concrete pillow, to that cardboard blankets, and freeze your ass to death. Yes, this city will leave to die on the same stretch of sidewalk where banks stretch into the sky. And I wonder, as even now, skin row is being gentrified, as the city, as the system, as the pigs, presume past poverty, past hunger, past homelessness, to the very edge of existence on skin row, where all the so-called complexities of an economy are laid bare, where the rich are literally stacked up on the poor. Los Angeles is full of grotesque absurdity, especially on Skid Row, where they millions annually policing the misery of people with nowhere to go so their pockets are empty and you ain't got nothing and change is just not coming when well, there's no real difference between a booming metropolis and a barren desert and the world of money passes by you, passes through you, as though you were just part of the scenery protected in the knowledge that they're serviced by people. Angeles is full of pigs. <laughs> so we're here at the International Poetry Festival. This poem is about international struggles going around the world. Um, it's called I Remember the Alamo, but it takes the Alamo and puts it more in a historical context of being kind of an anti-colonial uh, struggle. And uh, one time I was heckled during this. And someone screamed, like, how do you know? Were you there? I was like, yeah, I was there. I stabbed Amy Crockett. If you don't shut the fuck up, I'll stab you too. <laughs> so that's how I deal with hecklers. Here we go. Dream of the Alamo. Because I remember learning about the Alamo like a little kid and being told, go back to Mexico. Do you remember the Alamo? Because I remember learning about the Alamo like a little kid and being told, go back to Mexico and eat your tacos. Like I remember learning about the Alamo, you hear it all the time. I'm not a racist. I just believe in rule of law. We're part of a legal, don't you get? What I don't get is how the same people back in the Iraq invasion now want to complain about something called illegal immigration. You know, folks being in places they don't belong. These people, with the legality of immigrants, the criminality of workers, well, I have those criminals I feel should never have left home. Their names were Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. Monroe, where are your documents? You hear it all the time. Well, if they were real men, they would stay in their own country and fix it. Yet, when the Mexican presidential election was stolen in 2006, the people took to the streets, shutting down the capital for five months. Bush won not one, but two elections, and we didn't do a goddamn thing. Don't tell me Mexicans don't have fights. That same year, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Mexicans, poured into American streets in protests, organized in less than two weeks. Don't tell me Mexicans aren't organized, and don't tell me all this talk is divisive. 
Because unless you're a racist, my pride is not divisive. Unless you're a racist, my dignity is not divisive. Because otherwise, you're actually arguing that I should be without it. And another thing, my family, my community, we are not an ethnic study. No, we are a course in human history. Because we are as real and as valid and as universal as anybody. So for anyone who would say to me that it's divisive or would say racist when I say that I'm proud to be Latino, well, get ready, buddy, because I say this. From Caracas to the Pampas to the Chiapas to East Los Angeles, from the lowliest plate dishwasher in the loneliest cafe all the way down up north, down south to the southernmost corner of Argentina, wherever there's so many as one of us, I say, Viva, Viva, Viva America Latina. Now, there are some who will tell you what you just witnessed was hate speech. <laughs> Nonsense. I love everybody. So long as they remain lovely. But wait a minute, man. The minute you start bringing up families or calling our children anchor babies, then yeah, we got some problems. Because I hate racism. And I hate economic imperialism. And I hate transnational capitalism. I am a communist soy, un communista, and that is what I am. I make no more apology for that than I do for being Mexican. But yeah, 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 these people aren't racist. Thanks for being rule of law. We're part of legal, don't you get yet? But anyone that rises, like, go back to Mexico, do your drugs, eat your tacos, or some really off the wall bullshit like, remember the Alamo. Well, I do remember the Alamo. Like, I'm in the Indian Fu. Like, I'm in the Ted Offensive. Like, I'm in the Battle of Little People in the Wars of Pontiac. Like, I'm in Nat Turner's Midnight Ride. Like, I'm in Cubans and Angolans shot the forces of apartheid from African skies at the Battle of Quito, Guadalajara. Like, I remember the Alamo. Like, I remember Magellan's watery grave of the Island of Mactan, where people not get known as Filipinos with no more than bamboo bowls and for Spanish conquistadors and steel plate armor and drown their asses less than three feet of water. Like, I remember the Alamo. Sermons of Oscar Romero, El Grito de Miguel Hidalgo, The Cry of Freedom of Salvador Shore, The Sword of Simon Bolivar, like I remember the Alamo, like I remember the Mexican Revolution, like I remember the Haitian Revolution, like I remember the Irish Revolution, like I remember the Iranian Revolution, like I remember the Algerian Revolution, walking the Casbah, like I remember the Alamo, like I remember the Cuban Revolution, like I remember the Nicaraguan Revolution, like I remember the Chinese Revolution, like I remember the Russian Revolution, like I remember every piece of people's or anti-colonial history, so yeah, 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 you racist son of a bitch, I do remember the Alamo. <laughs> I just read that shit a little differently. <laughs> if you find the Confederate flag offensive, so too should you find the nickel. If you find the Confederate flag offensive, so too should you find the name of this nation's capital. If you find the Confederate flag offensive, so too should you find the American flag, they all stand for the same things. Racism and capitalism. When rich kids pass through cities, such as Watts, South Central, East Los Angeles, Compton, they're told to watch their wallets. When mayors, governors, city councilmen have allocated funds for cities such as Watts, South Central, East Los Angeles, Compton, it tells all to remember the budgets, yet they still find ways to fund the building of more prisons and the ramping up of police departments staffed by lawless men who run wild the street, making the law as they go. They call this service and protection. But then again, they've always had a funny way of looking at things. Like history books that teach children hallow, hollow preambles that include phrases such as we the people as drafted by land bearers and slaveholders, invaders and tree breakers, backstabbers and bastards and trained as our founding fathers. But I'm told times are changing. They're making slow but steady progress in a uniquely American process. But to be honest, I don't feel any change and I don't see much difference between gentrification and the Trail of Tears. The Chavez Ravine or post katrina New Orleans is when the hurricane struck, when the levees broke with a few pen strokes, they set in motion what they had already planned. It wasn't incompetence. It wasn't negligence. No. It was some straight up evil shit. Oh yes. They plan to rebuild New Orleans along the lines of an amusement park. A beautiful place to visit with nowhere to live. They don't want them back. They don't want them back. Who are they and what do I mean by them? Let me be clear. 
Let me be clear, I am not talking about a black, white, Latino, Middle Eastern, Asian divide. No, I am talking about the Fortune 500 America Incorporated. Give us your poor, your tired, your huddled masses so we can work their asses. Send us your coffee ship Irish, we'll turn the children of factory workers. Send the sickly Italians through Ellis Island, we'll spread out the country and die the black lung or love no maskers. You see, back then, if you want to form a union, the color of your eyes, the complexion of your skin offer no protection, no, you'd have to shoot it out with Carnegie and Rockefeller's men, Jay Gould and Jim Crow, walking hand in hand in the Robert Barron era of white privilege. Poor whites had the right to lynch black men, to kill Indians, to beat Mexicans, and then to starve. Right alongside with them. Because you cannot eat racism. And you cannot clothe your children in racism. And when they question, Mom, Mom, where are we going to sleep tonight? I don't know, son. But at least we're not sticks is not a suitable answer. Because racism can only ever be used by a privileged few to divide the many, to divide us, to divide we, the people. We are the people, so you cannot lift a finger for the immigrants unless you're prepared to raise your fist and fight for the rights of all of us. And you cannot eliminate black poverty or eliminate brown poverty without eliminating all poverty. Because striking at racism without attacking capitalism is like cutting down strange fruits and then leaving the fucking tree. Home. Thank you, um, all of you guys for being here. You love the audience. There's some books for sale over that way somewhere. Ask them, let me know. Um, some of them are mine. You should buy them. All right, uh, that's my last poem. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for everything. That's it. That's, it. that's the end of my thanks. All right, poem. <laughs> this is my family who's ever talked to me. I climb my family tree like Helen Keller, deaf, dumb, and blind. Piecing together what it meant to be Mexican, what it meant to be American, in the broken home of the Cussie in the historically and still Mexican section of Great East Los Angeles. My father, raised by the belt buckle, raised by parents who go months without speaking, raised me under the influence of the model. Under his raised fist, under his raised voice, he raised a stuttering and shell shocked child. Horrified and contemptuous. My mother, raised with love, raised with encouragement, raised a second born, first generation, born in a new country. A beautiful and curious woman raised me with a library card. Raised a boy genius, how to raise his hand, how to raise his voice, how to raise questions in the historically and still Mexican section of Great East Los Angeles. I learned how to love, and I learned how to hate in the same place, at the same time. By five, I quote Shakespeare, roll with the punches, identify the instruments of orchestra and fall asleep to the sounds of gunshots, pretended they were fireworks. To the sounds of my father screaming, pretended it was a television under the cover of blankets in the deepest, darkest, loneliest stretch of the night by flashlight, I learned how to read or pretend to be asleep to avoid life. But five, I memorized the names and terms of all the presidents. It became something of an obsession, went from something to someone just not sure who. By eight, they would be proud of me. I told my father I could see myself in the Oval Office before he sat me down and said, Son, we're a Mexican, and this is America. That is never going to happen. The history of my family was never taught to me. I climbed that family tree bitter and thorny. Her stories of my great grandfather died sick. Off the Colorado black when he got slaving away in the coal mines of America. Read a book about something called the Mexican Repatriation Act. And I began to piece together what brought him here and what sent him back. Well, the story about my grandfather, then my grandmother was made that much clearer. And I began to understand that our entire family had been deported from this country in the 1930s for no reason other than that last name and the color of their skin. And I began to piece together how I may never have been born and how that never happened. Yes, I have spent the better part of my life understanding that oppression runs through my veins, and that is not a history that goes down easy. So the boy genius who would be present now began to hate this country and all that it stood for and all that it trampled over, the racism that around my mother's father and drove from its borders, the poverty and the misery that drove my father's father to become an alcoholic, that bitter legacy that never goes down easy that drove my father and I to become alcoholics. Yes, I hated all of it. It's mindless consumption. It's mindless labor. The pointless of moving a box from one corner of the room to another, the misery of living paycheck to paycheck as a mindless slave to next month's rent in a heartless economy that drove me towards
much homelessness as I slept in my car under the stars, under the flag, under all glory flying so arrogantly over me. I hated the stairs of co-workers who knew I had not seen a bed in weeks. The whispers you could hear had never known what it was to shower in a gas station sink, and I hated the hatred that tore me from my father, the pride that kept me from my mother. When we lost that job, I shot through my days aimlessly, beaten down by the summer heat like a stray dog wandering the summer streets, and I remember my mother reading me Shakespeare and all that I was supposed to be. Some kind of prodigy, some kind of genius, but now homeless, and I hated this country and all that it stood for. A government supposedly formed by the people that never had anything to offer me but debt. With jobs that robbed my time and energy of all meaning and value and took and took and took until there was nothing left in this cruel joke of a meritocracy which now seemed poised, guiltless, and indifferent to lead me to my death. Yes, I hated all of it. But no one near as much as I hated myself. And I found myself drunk and debased, barely able to stand. Barely still a man in a walking, talking, drunken coma, sleepwalking through a childhood sanctuary, I found myself drunk at the library, applying for a card. But I came back the next day, and the next, and the next, and the next, and I read, and I read, and I read, and I began to see the true history of this country. The real nature of its economy was never taught to me, and never been a question of peoples, or borders, or a new world order, and it wasn't the white man, it wasn't my dad, it wasn't my old boss, there was no personal failure, no global conspiracy, no Illuminati, but the very nature of the global economy, the very nature of private property, and I read, and I read, and I read, I read Marx, I read Engels, I read Lenin, and I began to agree with them, I saw for the first time that I wasn't alone, that it wasn't my fault, that I was a worker, that I was working class, and I was proletarian, and so very proud of it, a boy genius who dreamed of becoming president, but grew into a man much more likely to write his local congressman, demand his resignation, was he could provide a country worth living in, one free of racism, one free of prisons, one free of the exploitation and oppression of women, one free from the social Darwinism that makes beasts of us all. place within it was never taught to me because there's some things you have to learn for yourself. It's true honor. Thank you.